I want to thank Stephen for the story this morning. That was more than just a story, it was a precursor to the rest of the story. So thank you very much. We've already had a prayer, but I just would like to ask the Holy Spirit to guide as we uh, spend our time together. Our dear Heavenly Father, we are so grateful that you are with us this morning. We are so grateful that you are the kind of God who specializes in wanting to spend time with us, all kinds of us. And this morning, as we look at the Philistines, as we look at some really um, outsider kind of people and some insider frozen chosen kind of people, we ask that you'd help us to hear what you're trying to tell us. Please forgive me for my mistakes and may your spirit be upon us is our earnest prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. The story that Stephen shared this morning has a sequel, and I'm sure you've read that story before, but there's a lot of details that, that may not have crossed your mind. And I was pretty excited this last week as I've been looking at this story in some detail. Now, for those of you that like to go for a drive in their car, maybe kids with mum and dad, maybe you yourself like to go on a road trip, it's kind of an adventure going somewhere different. So I'd like you to come with me this morning on a bit of an adventure. We need a special car because, as you can see on the map, I think it's on behind me, it'll come up now. The, uh, the map on the wall uh, requires this vehicle to go across the desert and also across the oceans. If we were to drive at 100 kilometers per hour and left tomorrow morning, we'd get there just in time for Sabbath next week. It's about six days driving at 100 kilometers per hour. And that's not allowing for toilet stops or petrol stops. So we're just coming across um, Australia, across India to the northwest, and then on to uh, the Arabian Peninsula. And I want to take you this morning to where Stephen left us off at the uh, story of uh, Samuel in Shiloh. This is a photograph of modern day Shiloh. This is where the temple of God was pitched. We don't exactly know where it was, but uh, there's a picture I'll show you in just a minute of our best guess of where it is. There's been some interesting excavations just in the last 12 months or so, right here at this site and you might be interested to see what's been found here. As uh, we saw in the story, there was a tabernacle at Shiloh. Priest Eli and Samuel and the family of Eli and the priests served, or they were supposed to be serving the Lord here, but perhaps they were also, some of them, selfishly serving themselves. Sounds like priest Eli and his sons were not necessarily very godly people. Inside the sanctuary, you see that little, um, the big structure there off to your left, there's the, um, the holy place, and inside the most holy place at the far back end of the tabernacle is a special piece of furniture, the uh, Ark of the Covenant, the Shekinah glory. This is just an artist impression. We don't know exactly what it looked like, but the Bible tells us it was a golden box with two angels on it. And the question I want to start with this morning is, what was the point of a golden box with two angels on it? What is the significance of this piece of furniture? What's it there for? Anybody can help me out. What was the point of this golden box? It contained the Ten Commandments, yes. It had some stuff inside it. Where else in the Bible do we see angels in, in holy places? The throne of God. And the, the book of Exodus and the book of Numbers suggest to us that the Shekinah glory, the presence of God, would hover above these angels. Now, in this furniture, there's two golden angels. But in heaven, there's actually four angels spirits, four angels, and they have six wings each, and they are hovering and surrounding the throne of God. God doesn't have 
golden statues in his palace there are living beings that are actually gracing the presence of the Lord. This is a holy place because this is where God dwells. All right, I'm going to just show you a picture of where we think this um, tabernacle must have been pitched in Shiloh. It's a bit of an educated guess, and I'm sorry the picture's a bit small there, but if you were to zoom in a little bit and, and uh, have a look, you can kind of see We've got a little bit of a, see that yellow cubicle box type thing? It uh, helps us to see a little bit. Oh, thank you, Josh. The little yellow um, box there is the area where they think that the tabernacle could have been pitched. We know how the tabernacle was supposed to be oriented. And this is where our story will unfold this morning. If you have your Bibles with you, please turn with me to 1 Samuel chapter 4. And let's continue on. Uh, from where Stephen uh, took us. 1 Samuel chapter 4. 1 Samuel chapter 4 is a very sad part in Earth's history. And if you compare the challenges in the time of 1 Samuel 4 to uh, Maryborough in uh, 2020, you might find some similarities there. There are some big challenges for God's people and even for foreigners in the time of 1 Samuel. Samuel chapter 4. Remember that priest Eli had been warned by Samuel. God had come to Samuel and said, hey, some bad things are going to happen to your family because you have not been honorable. Your sons are doing the wrong thing at church, taking advantage of people who are trying to follow God. Now, let's turn to 1 Samuel chapter 4 and let's just have a look at what happens. As predicted, a battle, a trouble comes. I'm going to just uh, have us look at uh, verses 5 up to verse 9. Verse 5, I'm going to start reading here. First Samuel chapter 4, verse 5. As this, uh, as this battle is taking place, the Israelites decide to bring this box to battle. Verse 5. As soon as the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord came into the camp, all Israel gave a mighty shout so that the earth resounded. I can imagine if it was 2020, they would have sung the song, we are the champions. We're gonna win. We're gonna kick your backside because we have our special box on our team. Verse six tells us, when the Philistines heard the noise of the shouting, they said, what does this great shouting in the camp of the Hebrews mean? And when they learned that the ark of the Lord had come to the camp, the Philistines were what? What happened to the Philistines? They were afraid, for they said, A God has come into the camp. And they said, Woe is us, for nothing like this has happened before. These are some foreigners. These are some non-believers in the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. But they're saying, Nothing like this has happened before. And then they said, Woe to us, verse 8, who can deliver us from the power of these mighty gods? Is that true? Are there mighty gods that have just come to the battlefield? Are the Philistines accurate with their theology? Do they know what's going on? Not really, do they? Nevertheless, they, they remember some things. They say, These are the gods who struck the Egyptians with every sort of plague in the wilderness. Was that true? Had these gods struck the Egyptians with all kinds of plagues in the wilderness? Was that true either? Not quite. The theology is not quite right. These, these Philistines don't have the right story, but they have some loose facts based on a real story. <laughs> They've heard some stuff and they're thinking, we're in trouble, verse nine. Take courage, be men, O Philistines, lest you become slaves to the Hebrews as they have been to you. Be men and fight. And there's a picture of them trying to fight. These Philistine men decided to play with everything they had. They fought bravely. They took everything, as, as we say in modern sports, 
They took everything to the field and left it out there on the footy pitch. They didn't leave anything in the tank because they were genuinely scared. They thought, we haven't got a show. What happened after this? What, what was the result of this battle between these non-believers, these people that didn't believe in the God of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob, except that they were scared of him, and then these people that had the golden box, the holy, the holy furniture from the tabernacle that had supposedly in the past had the glory of God hovering above it. What happened in this battle? We're told that it went badly for the Israelites and they were sorely defeated. If we look at 1 Samuel chapter 5 now, verses 1 and 2. This is what it says. When the Philistines captured the Ark of, the, of God, they brought it from Ebenezer to Ashdod. Then the Philistines took the Ark of God and brought it into the house of Dagon and set it up beside Dagon. There's a map, top right-hand corner, and you can see Ebenezer. That's where the battle was near Aphek. And then the Ark was taken by the Philistines down to Ashdod. And we know where these places are, by the way. Interestingly, it looks like, if you remember the story of Eli passing away and his um, grandson being born, um, Ichabod, it's quite likely that at this time the Philistines must have come to Shiloh and it's quite likely that they destroyed it. And part of the archaeological evidence we've come up with in the last couple of years is that it looks like Shiloh was in fact burned and destroyed with fire at about this time. So it does look like after the messenger came to Shiloh that everything was destroyed. The, tem the tabernacle must have been taken away and relocated. All right, so now we have the ark, this box, this golden furniture from the most holy place of God, but it's in the wrong place. It's in a tabernacle or a temple of a foreign god. Let's look at verses 3 to 5. First Samuel 5, 3 to 5, and it says, And when the people of Ashdod rose early the next day, behold, Dagon had fallen face down on the ground before the ark of the Lord. So they took Dagon and put him back in his place. What lovely people to help their god out like this. But when they rose early on the next morning, behold, Dagon had fallen face downward on the ground before the ark of the Lord, and the head and both of his hands were lying cut off on the floor. Only the waist or the trunk of Dagon was left to him. And I have an artist's impression. I don't know if you can see the little fish tail there in the top of the picture. There's considerable um, evidence to suggest that Dagon may have possibly been a fish god. There is some debate about this, but there's some good reason to think that he may have been a fish god. So the bottom part was like a, a mermaid or a merman, and the top part was the, like a human. And day after day, as these people of Ashdod put up their statue, you can see the Ark of the Covenant there in the background, Dagon is falling flat on his face toward the ark like as a sign of respect, like a sign of obeisance, kind of like the sheaves that in Joseph's dream that bowed um, towards him. This statue kept on falling down and had to be propped up again and again and again. What do you think the Philistines started to think? What's going on here? Why is our statue falling down? We've got good engineers. Our God is a powerful God. This Dagon God has helped us to defeat the Israelites. We stole their God. In those days, by the way, when people went to wars, they would steal each other's gods. We have stolen the God of Israel. The God of Israel now is weak. He is in our temple. He has no more power, they thought. But evidently it wasn't working out too well. Let's have a look now at how the saga continues. Looking at verses 6 to 10, now we have a trail of destruction and woe as this golden 
furniture, this Ark of the Covenant, is taken around the country to try and figure out what's going on. We don't want Dagon falling on his face. The people began to get sick. They began to have hemorrhoids. They began to have trouble with their food and many, many people died. I don't want to go into the details. Those of you that are medically inclined, you can look it up. But it's uh, not a very pleasant way to die. And many, many people started to die in the city where the ark was. So the people of Ashdod said, hey, let's get this ark and take it over to Gath. Those are good, strong people. Don't forget, Gath is where Goliath is going to come from. These are strong warriors. They're not afraid of a couple of foreign gods from a faraway country. They can handle this one. When the Ark of the Covenant comes to Gath, guess what happens? People start getting sick. All these plagues of mice start coming out. Over the, by the way, the Ark was taken in about October for seven months, November, December, January, February, March, April, May, as the wheat harvest came on, these people are getting really, really worried. They're getting sick and many of their loved ones are passing away in horrible ways. Finally, the ark goes up north to Ekron or Tel Mikni, which is where the story will continue for us. Let's have a look at verse 10. 1 Samuel 5 verse 10. So they, that's the Philistines, sent the ark of God to Ekron. But as soon as the ark of God came to Ekron, the people of Ekron cried out. They said, they have brought around to us the ark of the God of Israel to kill us and our people. Now they're scared. This God is a powerful God. We are worried that this God is coming into our countryside, our city. We cannot survive in the presence of this God, they said. Verse 11, then they sent and gathered together all of the lords, that's the, um, the leaders, the people in charge of the Philistines, and they said, send away the ark of the God of Israel and let it return to its own place that it may not kill us and our people. For there was a deathly panic throughout the whole city. The hand of God was very heavy there. I've got a picture of Ekron. This is where we are pretty sure the city would have stood um, in those days. And that one has also been partly excavated. There's more work to do there. But you can see this is great wheat growing country. They would have depended here on wheat. Over in Ashdod, it was more the coast, probably more fishing. Over here, wheat, but now they have plagues of mice and the mice are eating the wheat. And without the food, the people are gonna go hungry. These people are really, really worried. They didn't have coals and woolies in those days either. So let's go on. Verse 12, the men who did not die were struck with tumors and the cry of the city went up to heaven. Does this remind you of the Israelites in Egypt crying out to the Lord and their voice going up to heaven? O oh Lord, have mercy on us. 6 verse 1. The ark of the Lord was in the country of the Philistines seven months. And it goes on the next few verses here. They began to try a scientific experiment. Some of the leaders are saying, this God is too deadly. Let's send this ark back to where it came from. We can't handle this God. There are other people who are a bit skeptical. The cynics, the atheists, if you like, the non-believers. And they say, nah. We're not sure if the ark is the problem. This, this could be a coincidence. Maybe the challenges of our land are just, what do you call it? Uh, unlucky luck. You know, the fact that the Dagon guy fell down a few times, that could have been earthquakes. Yeah, some plague happened in a city over there. We've got mice over here. It could be coincidence. So the men get together and say, Let's do a scientific experiment. Even in antiquity, even 3,000 years ago, people were skeptical. They weren't sure. They wanted to check. How can we know if this God is really a powerful God or if it's just bad luck? And so they came up with an experiment. And have a think with me here. 
is this experiment valid? Would it work? If we were to do this experiment today and get results, would the results be conclusive? Would they be good data for us? This is what they said, verse 2 up to verse uh, 9 or thereabouts. They said, we need to get together some offerings in case it is a, a real God, in case it is a powerful God. Let's get together some, some offerings, some, some guilt offerings. Let's say sorry to this God in case it's a real God. Um, and verse 4, what, shall, what kind of offering shall we give? And so they suggested, let's give some golden tumors, some golden mice, um, the number according to the number of cities. And then verse 5 and 6 goes on. There's a warning in verse 6. Don't forget what happened to the Egyptians. So evidently the story of the Exodus had traveled. And these people were thinking about it and saying, if this God really is true, if he really did destroy Egypt, we don't want that to happen to us. Let's be mindful of that story. Maybe it's a true story. They said, let us prepare a cart, a brand new one. Let's find two cows who have just given birth and they are still feeding their young with milk. Let's pick cows who have never been trained. They've never had a yoke. This is in verse 7. And let's take the ark of the Lord, verse 8, and put it on the cart. Put the box inside the cart with these gifts and let's see what happens. Is this a valid test? If I were to get an ox cart today, I'm not a farmer, maybe the farmers can speak for me. If I get two milk cows, put a yoke on them and have a cart at the back and put some stuff in the cart, what would be the normal response for a couple of cows yoked together today? If they've got young right there, they're milk, they're, they're locals, they haven't been trained, they're not um, normally used for plowing, what would happen to those cows? Key suggests not much at all, okay? Any, any, any further data or experience? I, I would imagine they'd probably stay there with their young, right? The grass is green right there. What would be the motive for those cows to go anywhere? According to Josephus, Josephus is a Jewish historian who writes about the story, he says, they took the ox cart to a place where the three roads came together and that's where they left the cart and they watched to see what would happen. I think it was verse 9, was it? And watch, verse 9. If it goes up on the way to its own land, to Beth Shemesh, then it is he who has done us this great harm. But if not, then we shall know that it is not his hand that struck us. It happened to us by coincidence. Fair test, right? Elijah on Mount Carmel. If this God sends the fire, it's him. If it's not, we got the wrong number. Okay, so they did this, verse 10, verse 11, and the story uh, unfolds for us. So there's a picture of a couple of cows in a more modern context. These ones, I think, have been trained, and they're pulling a load um, under direction. Inside the cart, we have some special gifts, some offerings, some idols, if you like, some, some trinkets as a, as a guilt offering, as a... We are sorry, God of Israel, offering that is sent back on this ox cart. And here goes the cart. Here comes the Philistines, the lords, watching to see what happens. They get all the way through to Beth Shemesh. And the story, both in Josephus and in the Bible text, it tells us that these, cow these, these cows did not stop. They did not turn. They did not waver. It was like they were on train tracks. They just kept on going, steady pace, consistent. It's about 12 or 13 kilometers at least, and the terrain would have been winding like this. So it would have taken them probably, um, I guess, I don't know, three or four hours. I don't know how fast cows walk, but it would have taken uh, a part of a day, probably a half of a day, I'm guessing, um, to, to make that kind of distance. When they get to Beth Shemesh, the Philistines, the leaders, they want to watch what's going to happen. Beth Shemesh, by the way, Bet in Hebrew, this is the house of the sun. This place had been the place where sun worship had been the in thing. But in the time of Joshua, Beth Shemesh had been gifted to the 
priests to the Levites who were supporting the people of the tribe of Judah. So Beth Shemesh wasn't just a random place. Beth Shemesh is the place where all the church pastors live. Beth Shemesh is the place where, I won't mention any modern names, but they're the leaders of God's people today, supposedly. The people who put God first, the people who should be leading the people to Jesus. That's where the Ark of the Covenant ended up, in Beth Shemesh. First uh, Samuel 6 verse 18 tells us, uh, when they got there, they set up by a great stone, there's the great stone, and they set the Ark of the Lord uh, in the field, and they had this big sacrifice of thanksgiving and respect to the Lord. However, we are going to have a problem. Let's just hold our finger in 1 Samuel chapter 6 for a minute and turn to Numbers. Numbers chapter 4, and then we'll come back to our story. What's the big deal about this special box? Why is it so important for God's box to be treated in a certain way? Numbers chapter 4, verses 15 and verse 20. Let's have a look. Numbers chapter 4, verse 15. Aaron, when Aaron and his sons have finished covering the sanctuary and all the furnishings, this, by the way, is the instructions when, this, when the tabernacle was being built and guided by God. As the camp sets out, after that the sons of Kohath shall come to carry these, but they must not what? They must not touch the holy things. What does it mean for something to be holy? Sanctified. It's sanctified. What does it mean to be sanctified? What's a good word for like a, like a grade three, four type person? Bless, Bless yeah. Special treasure. special, a special treasure. I like that. Something that's sanctified is set apart. I have these special leather shoes that I wear to church. I've got work boots that I use when I go to the workshop. I wouldn't wear these shoes at the workshop because they'd get dirty and messed up and scratched, and then it would be poor form for more formal occasions. I have special work clothes that I wear at work, and I have special play clothes for play, and I've got uniform for when I do certain things. I wouldn't go to a wedding, if, or, or, you, you wouldn't expect a bride to go to a wedding in, in an overalls or something like that normally. Normally a wedding is a very special occasion and she'd be wearing the nicest wedding dress she could afford. Something that is holy is set apart, is special, is unique. 4 verse 15. They shall not touch these holy things lest they die. These are the things of the tent of meeting that the sons of Kohath are to carry. And it specifically mentions the Ark of the Covenant. And it, so verse 15 says no touching. What about verse 20? They shall not go in to look on the holy things even for a moment, lest they die. And number 7 verse 4 also talks about the use of the ox carts. The Levites did use ox carts, but not for the furniture, only for the common things. So just a quick review. Numbers tells us no touching, no peeking and no carting. Okay? That's God's requirements, God's holy law for his special furniture, which represents his throne room in heaven. However, it doesn't work out that way because if we go back now to 1 Samuel, 1 Samuel chapter 6, verse 19, we find out that the people of God, the priests, of Beth Shemesh, the Levites who knew better, the people who stand before the Lord, they had a bit of a touch and a bit of a peek, didn't they? <laughs> and there's a bit of debate about how many people died, but we do know that some people died in Beth Shemesh. We, probably, we can probably think of at least 70 would have died. Some Bibles say 50,070. Um, it's probably the case that at least 70 out of a larger population would have died. Whatever the case, people were uh, 
once again fearful hey this ark is bringing us bad luck if you want to call it that we've had a bad experience people are dying because of the presence of this ark here is a, a picture of uh, modern day Beth Shemesh this is probably more like this the uh, the town center and that rock would have been probably outside this picture on the outskirts okay now this brings us to a bit of a problem because we have people who are scared of the ark nobody wants to be around the ark because the ark is killing people or people think the ark is killing people and so look at first Samuel 6 verse 19 verse 20 says then the men of Beth Shemesh said who is able to stand before the Lord this holy God and whom sh and to whom shall he go up away from us verse 21 so they sent messengers to the inhabitants of Kirith Jerim saying the Philistines have returned the ark of the Lord come down and take it up to you verse 1 of chapter 7 the men of Kirith Jerim came and took the ark of the Lord and brought it to the house of Abinadab on the hill they consecrated his son Eleazar to have charge of the ark of the Lord so people are scared of the ark except for the people at Kirith Jerim let's just hold that thought for just a minute we're going to dovetail these two stories together in a, just a few short minutes I'm going to just have you turn with me if you're willing uh, 2nd Samuel chapter 6 we've been in 1st Samuel 6 now we're going to go to 2nd Samuel 6 for a parallel story 1st Samuel chapter 6 the Philistines put the ark on an ox cart and I believe God miraculously brings this cart from Philistia to Beth Shemesh 1st Samuel chapter 6 now 2nd Samuel chapter 6 this story is very similar we're about a hundred years later this time it's King David the man after God's own heart King David has just defeated the Philistines believe it or not David has just brought his army and captured Jerusalem Jebus uh, the Jebusites and now he is saying I want the special golden Ark of the Covenant which has been in some funny out-of-the-way places for the last hundred years I want it to come to Jerusalem to where I live and I want God to be welcome to dwell in our midst 2nd Samuel chapter 6 verse 1 David again gathered all the chosen men of Israel 30,000 and David rose and went with all the people who were with him from Baal Judah to bring up from there the ark of God which is called by the name of the Lord of hosts who sits enthroned on the cherubim there we go the glory of the Lord hovering in the midst of the Shekinah, of the uh, angels the Shekinah glory and they carried the ark of God on a new cart verse 3 and brought it out of the house of Abinadab which was on the hill and Uzzah and Aho the sons of Abinadab were driving the new cart see it's the same as before it's a new cart with the ark of the God oh, with the ark of God and Ahio went before the ark verse 5 David and all the house of Israel were celebrating before the Lord with songs and lyres and harps and tambourines and castanets and cymbals and when they came verse 6 to the threshing floor of Nakon Uzzah put out his hand to the ark of God and took hold of it for the oxen stumbled and verse 7 says the anger of the Lord was kindled against Uzzah and God struck him down there because of his error and he died there beside the ark of the Lord this ark is pretty serious business verse 8 says that David was angry and then in verse 9 we know the stages of of uh, grief anger verse 9 David was afraid of the Lord that day and he said how can the ark of the Lord come to me 
David, verse 10, was not willing to take the ark of the Lord into the city of David, but David took it aside to the house of Obed-Edom, the... Where's Obed-Edom from? Where do Gittites come from? Obed-Edom, the Gittite, is a Philistine. He comes from... The Gittites come from Gath. The same place as Samson. It's not Samson, sorry, not Samson. Same place as Goliath. Goliath and his brothers, who are very tall and have six fingers and six toes, they were also Gittites. David, the man after God's own heart, is too terrified for the Ark of the Covenant to come to his city, and so he asks for a volunteer. And Obed-Edom from Gath says, I'll take the Ark of the Covenant. God is welcome in my house. He's not a Jew, but he is clearly very, very respectful and very eager to have the Ark of the Covenant at his house. And what does it say in verse 11? The Ark of the Lord remained in the house of Obed-Edom, the Gittite, three months. And what happened? What happened when God stayed at the foreigner's house? the guy from Philistia who had his background from Gath. How does God treat those people? It's kind of embarrassing, isn't it? <laughs> Verse 11 says, The Lord blessed Obed-Edom and all his households. Not just Obed-Edom, but his wife and kids, his, if he had any underhead servants or not. His whole property was so blessed, so much so that David broke the Tenth Commandment. Verse 12, it was told King David, the Lord has blessed the household of Obed-Edom and all that belongs to him because of the ark of God. Was it really the ark that blessed Obed-Edom? What was it that blessed Obed-Edom? The presence of God. Thank you. So David went up and brought the ark of God from the house of Obed-Edom to the city of David with rejoicing. David had to, had to regain his courage. David got jealous. Why is this Gittite getting blessed? Why am I in Jerusalem scared of the Ark of the Covenant when this Philistine is being blessed by this Ark of the Covenant? Something's very, very interesting there. I want to just draw these threads together as we close we've got two groups of people we've got one group of people who are terrified of the ark of the covenant who are facing death and hardship and another group of the people that say we want the ark to feel welcome in our midst we want god to be with us we are excited or at least very grateful to have him here may he dwell with us and as we think about these two groups of people, they do not fall into neat groups. The Philistines, for example, what happened to them first up? They had all of this hardship. Dagon falls down. They had all these diseases. But then they put this ark on an ox cart, totally against the laws of numbers. The, the Philistines completely disobeyed God. I suggest perhaps it was unknowing. They didn't realize. They put this ark on the new cart, put these images on there and watch what happened. And God, I believe, blessed the Philistine lords for their respect. He blessed them for being open to God speaking to them and to following what was God's plan for their lives. Ironically, the people of Beth Shemesh, the priests of God, had a look and a peek, a touch, when they knew they shouldn't, the Philistines may have been watching and they may have been confused. Why are those priests of God doing that to the ark? We well, didn't realize that that was okay. Maybe it's okay to be peeking at the ark and everything else. Then we have David, who, like the Philistines, puts the ark on an ox cart. But David should have known better, right? David and the priests did have the full knowledge of what was in Numbers chapter 4 and chapter 7. And they did not follow that for reasons I'm not quite sure about. So then God is shipped out to the Gittite, to the Philistine, to the guy who comes from Gath. And I'm wondering to myself, how does that sit for you and for me today? 
It could be that we are Philistines in our hearts, or it could be that we are priests and Levites, or maybe we are believers from the good frozen chosen group of Israel. But what is it that makes us prepared to welcome the Ark of the Covenant? What is it that will take for you and me to say, I want God in my home this week. I want God to dwell with me. I'm not worried if God's presence rocks up at my front door. I want God to dwell. Now, at the end of time, and I think we're getting pretty close if we're not there already, it says that there's going to be two groups of people again. One group's going to say, rocks, mountains, please fall upon us. Who can stand the presence of the Lord? And another group of people saying, ah, hallelujah, at last, my Redeemer is here. Take me home, Jesus, I want to be with you. Two groups, they don't fall in denominations, they don't fall in countries. The story today tells us that they fall very awkwardly. The Gittite got the blessing that David was too scared to grasp. The Philistines were blessed for putting an ox cart and God's Ark of the Covenant together. Uzzah was killed for it. What's the lesson for us today? What's your choice as far as God's presence in your home? I would invite you to have a think about this. We're going to stand in just a few moments and sing a very unorthodox hymn. We don't sing it very often, number 90. And it's going to be inviting you to have a test. Check out the Lord. If you don't know about the Lord, you're not confident, you're not sure, hey God, I've had so much suffering and pain and anguish, things have gone wrong, I'm not sure, then God will respect you. God will help you like those Philistines to have a scientific experiment. God will reveal that he is in charge. Perhaps you're the frozen chosen. Maybe you're a believer who sits in church and says, I'm sorted, thanks, leave me alone. And let me warn you what happened to Uzzah and to King David. It's not as simple as what we do, where we come from or where we sit. It's a matter of whether our homes and our hearts are ready to invite Jesus. If you're willing, let's stand together and sing number 90. Let's ask Jesus to come into our hearts. Let's ask Jesus to help us to be humble and welcoming of his presence and the Holy Spirit. What a privilege that will be to see Jesus and to live with him face to face. Number 90, eternal God whose power upholds. Read carefully, sing carefully with me the words and let us be encouraged. Lord, how awesome you are. We are absolutely honoured that you are that kind of God who not only wants to dwell with us, but to work through us to bring joy, contentment, confidence, to dispel fear and sadness and all the injustice that we see in our own lives and in those that we love most. Please, Lord, come into our hearts, come into our homes. Lord, we have issues, we have baggage, we have problems, but we are thankful that you love us so much, just like you loved the Philistines, Obed-Edom. Thank you so much for loving the people even of Beth Shemesh and the people of kirith Jerem, and the people ultimately in Jerusalem. Please, Lord, come into our hearts and our homes. Please change us. If there's things in our lives that separate us from you, we ask that you'd help us to remove them. Please help us to learn from the mistakes of the Egyptians of old. Help us to learn from the mistakes of the Philistines in Ashdod. Help us to learn from the mistakes even of King David and the priests that should have known better in Beth Shemesh. Help us, Lord, to be your servants today. We are thankful that we are safe in your hands. We thank you that you want to bless and encourage us. And we place ourselves, our friends, our family, all those things that are dearest to us, we place in your hand this week. We thank you and praise you in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.